Hello, my name is I'm the founder of Mimbayu Fab Lab in Oroville, India. And I'm going to speak to you about the development of the open source portable cost 3D printer for Indian needs. Uh, Oroville is an international community based in nearby Pondicherry in South India. And uh, as a Fab Lab, uh, we started the development of uh, sustainable technologies uh, related to circular economy approach uh, that, uh, that are built locally, that are designed also locally by, uh, by our team. And uh, essentially we work with a lot of volunteers that come from all over the world uh, and India and uh, work with us in, uh, in developing, developing technologies in a variety of different uh, specialties. Uh, we not only design machinery, but we also do uh, training programs where people come from all over the world also and uh, all over India uh, to learn about the technologies. And we try to provide uh, follow-up and, uh, and uh, some consulting work. When needed. And the idea is that we would like to develop uh, the next generation of makers, uh, and in particular, the makers in uh, this area of South India have to deal with uh, special conditions, which include a high humidity, uh, dry forest areas with a lot of uh, uh, insects, for example, running around. And when you're dealing with electronics, when you're dealing with equipment, it needs to be very robust and it needs to be able to survive these elements, uh, be low cost and be easy to fix. So um, you could say that uh, South India and uh, in particular Oruga is a very good place to test equipment. Uh, and it's also, as it's a community that's been uh, around for over 25 years, and we were always struggling to develop uh, technologies. And whenever we didn't find a technology that was suitable, we had to develop them ourselves. So in fact, uh, Fab Lab is a term that's more recent than the existence of Oracle, which is uh, uh, a community full of innovations. The, the project that we do has uh, basically three areas that are uh, we develop. Uh, one is uh, making the, the maker space that we've developed is obviously an open source uh, uh, technologies that we are encouraging uh, all the students to apply the, to use the electronics that are open source to look around the world for designs that might be interesting and then adapting them to, to our conditions. A uh, typical example is, for example, uh, building uh, recycling equipment that uh, we looked at uh, designs, but uh, adapting them to the size and the uh, output that are needed for making an economic sense in this fire region. Um, the other area is, of course, the research part, the R&D part, and uh, we're working in developing new technology. So it's not only looking out at what's being developed, but sometimes we cannot find exactly what we need. And we have to basically uh, develop our own applications. And uh, there's many projects in our world that do this, uh, but uh, as a Fab Lab, we've been uh, researching mostly in uh, CNC type of applications, uh, computer numeric control applications for use in uh, sustainable development objectives for especially rural areas. And then uh, the, the equipment and the research uh, need to be combined with trainings. And uh, we have uh, trained many, many people, many individuals, many students that have come through Oregon. Uh, this includes uh, carpenters, uh, village mechanics, uh, a youth, uh, recent graduates, uh, uh, entrepreneurs, etc., and uh, they all come to learn. And uh, whenever they stay longer, they also volunteer. Um, and uh, for this particular project that we are going to share with you today, it's uh, 
Well, how do we develop the next uh, digital Macy? Let's say the, it's a whole uh, whole new environment, uh, large format 3D printing, house printing, and uh, it will require a whole set of skills that are maybe not yet combined fully, especially here in the um, The first printer that we made is a uh, is uh, actually like almost everywhere in the world, a small 3D printer uh, that fits in a desktop. Um, this was done around seven years back. And uh, and we tested it, we tried it, we modified it. Uh, you could say that we went through a hundred iterations and changes to try to make it better. And, uh, and this is very common for almost all makerspaces. Uh, then we decided uh, that we wanted to do a large format 3D printer. And uh, we ended up uh, building a uh, six meter tall printer, uh, which is around 5.5 meters wide. And uh, it's made out of uh, steel pipes and clamps, essentially. Um, then uh, once we used it and tested the machine for several years, uh, we decided that uh, after testing a lot of uh, earthen materials and stuff like that, that we wanted to develop a another printer, a printer that would actually be portable, that could actually be uh, moving from place to place easily, and uh, and be able to print basically a room uh, or a house. Um, and then uh, in 2022, we actually uh, developed a, a design uh, during the summer. Of 2022. Um, through, through the last uh, four or five years, uh, we've also worked on uh, designing and testing uh, different formulations uh, related to house, uh, house, uh, house walls that we would like to develop. So we printed uh, a number of designs and different materials. Um, we're actually material agnostic, uh, meaning we Many people are print, uh, using uh, mixtures based on cement, for example. Uh, we are actually using a lot of lime. Uh, partially the reason is it's uh, easier to obtain locally. And uh, also it's a very good uh, educational mix, uh, meaning the mix doesn't set very fast. So we can reuse the mix uh, several times. So these are the realities that we had. And... Uh, so we'll talk more about them in the presentation. The, the big printer, the first printer that we needed, we call it just the Big Delta. Um, so six meters high is quite a big uh, 3D printer, actually. Um, as far as we know, it's the only open source printer of that size. Uh, there are bigger printers, but they're basically commercial printers. Uh, ours is basically an open source uh, development that we, that we made here. And uh, it, uh, it includes an auger, a system of feeding uh, the nozzle. Um, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we didn't have uh, money to buy a pump, so we, we just feed the auger by hand. Um, the print area for the printer as a Delta printer is uh, a three meters high and about 1.8 meters in diameter. Um, if you look at the right side here, the, for those that are not familiar with the Delta machine, it's basically a triangle. It looks like a Delta, like the Greek uh, symbol Delta. And uh, there's three columns. Yeah, And uh, each one of these columns have a support, and uh, they're controlled by motors, uh, precision motors, stepper motors, or servo motors. And each column works independently. So depending on where you want this center uh, floating uh, island to move, uh, each one of these motors and these positions will change. So a Delta printer, the advantages of the Delta printer is precision, they're very high precision. They can actually uh, work very fast. In our case, speed is not so critical, Yeah, but uh, for most of the smaller Delta printers, uh, they're very, very fast. Um, and the other advantage is uh, actually, since the head is moving, where you're feeding the material, you don't need a, a bed. You don't need a moving bed, for example. Many designs of 3D printers, small and medium size, have uh, a sliding bed. 
in my in a Delta machine, you don't need that. And for our purpose, that was actually important because we wanted to print rather large things that we didn't want to have moved. And if you 3D print, uh, let's say, a, a mud uh, part, then uh, if you move it, it might uh, it might fail, it might crumble. So, so making a printer that didn't doesn't use a bed, a moving bed, was important. Um, and also, of course, we needed something that was low cost that wasn't going to break the bank because we didn't have much money to develop it. So, um, Delta printer that we built, the big Delta, was quite an interesting uh, technology, and we took advantage of that. Uh, we looked around the world to see what people have uh, had built, and based on the that study, we decided to build our own design. Um, what's the disadvantage of a Delta printer is you need double the height for just uh, because of the supports, these uh, uh, floating metal supports that are connected to this central port, uh, floating uh, uh, nozzle. It makes it so that uh, you need twice the height. So our printer has six meters or six meters high, but it can only print up to three meters in height. Uh, which six meters high is high enough that it didn't even fit into our uh, our workshop uh, shed. So we left it outside. Um, and because of the size, uh, they become rather cumbersome to move. Uh, at least this uh, large printer is rather cumbersome to move. We don't really want to move it. So it's not, not a portable system. It's a system that's fixed. It's a perfectly good system to do testing on but it's not going to be moved from one place to the other. Um, the printer the, is basically made out of steel pipes, uh, marine grade plywood, uh, it has linear guide rails, um, which are made of steel. And uh, we we shopped around and uh, uh, we made a uh, linear guide with supports was going to cost us the same as the money that we had for the for the project itself, so we built our own. Uh, we just bought the parts. Um, and we used aluminum window sliding, siding as, uh, as the bottom support, and a piece of square pipe below it to to make it rigid enough. And uh, that whole assembly we made it locally uh, ourselves. So uh, the the system works with pulleys and belts. And uh, the assembly is actually assembled with uh, clamps. So there's no welding uh, on the system. And this was important so that there's no warping on the assembly. Um, the whole device is controlled by a RAMPS uh, controller. So the RAMPS controller are Arduino open source uh, controllers. And these are quite uh, popular and common for small 3D printers. So we actually use the same controller as you would use in a small printer. The only difference is uh, we don't use the small Lulu drivers for uh, moving the motors. We actually connected them to external drives uh, because the motors we use are actually larger motors. We use NEMA 3-4 motors, uh, stepper motors for this uh, installation. Um, and uh, in order for the motors to be small, we need to make sure that the load on the motors is very limited. So we use uh, some counterweights, and the counterweights are basically a PVC pipe full of sand uh, connected to a pulley and helping support the, the weight of the extruder and, and moving parts. So then the motors can be small. Um, so uh, the students and volunteers that built the system were high school students and also uh, young college students. So uh, over the course of two years, two summers, we basically worked on the project and got it running. Um, so this was a, a slow process, but it was a very interesting process for everybody involved. And uh, we were very happy to make it run the, from the very first day. So the, the, here's some pictures of the machine. So you can see the size. Over here, you have me standing next to the, uh, the nozzle uh, system, which is the center of this space. And you have the three columns 
uh, on the three sides. You can only see part, uh, just partial side of one column over here. And as I said, it's six meters high, so it's a big print. And uh, I'll let Venkat explain a little bit about the machine. Now we are standing inside the 3D printer, and it's a big six meter tall 3D printer, delta type. And once we made, once we make the mix, and then we transfer the mix to here, and then we we feed the mix manually for now. This is the auger, and also it also acts as an extruder. We feed the mix manually while printing, and then at the bottom we print. We can print up to uh, 1500 by 1500 mm size, and it can go up to 1 meter tall. Here we have uh, an example of the uh, the product of the printer, which is actually these uh, Adobe structures that we were building. That uh, this is actually a piece of a wall that uh, we assembled later into uh, sides of walls um, in a building uh, right next to the printer. So uh, here's again here's the nozzle system and uh, the supports on the side, and then this box is the stepper drives actually. And uh, over here is the stepper motor, and uh, these are the guide rails, uh, the linear rails that are going up and down, that are a very, very precise uh, way of moving um, the control system for the machine. Uh, the, the next project which we uh, developed was the polar printer. This, uh, this portable polar printer design, and we've been working on it for several years. Uh, the first design uh, is a design with a single pole. Uh, simply, it's uh, similar to a crane, a construction crane, yeah, that you see sometimes in tall buildings. Uh, so if you can see here in this diagram, you have the uh, pipes that are vertical. And uh, here there's a carriage, and then the carriage you have wheels, so the, the carriage can go up and down. And uh, then horizontally you have some pipes and a lattice system, and you have a hose coming through, and then the nozzle that prints. So uh, the printer in itself, when it prints, it can technically print round, but you can also print square, you can print, print angle, you can print in whatever shape you want. Uh, it's simply the fact that it's rotating around an axis that makes a perfect circle, of course, but uh, it's whatever is within the boundary of that area that uh, you can print. Now, this is in our first design of the machine, we have a three meter radius. So we can meet, uh, we can uh, print actually uh, up to six meters in diameter. Um, in our next uh, machine, after we test this machine, we will actually put a rail system below and be able to print like uh, you could technically print forever. As long as the rail is there and you can keep on going, you can print one, let's say, room after another room, uh, another room after another room. So the, the, the idea is this printer becomes very, very uh, flexible and, uh, and there's a lot of possibilities uh, to build larger structures with that design. Um, for some of you that maybe are familiar with robots, it's kind of like a SCADA, SCADA robot system, but uh, simplified, let's say, um, because we're using very simple elements to generate uh, this polar printer. Uh, so why, why do we choose a polar printer? It's uh, essentially, you see around the world the uh, different designs that people are using. And the uh, Cartesian design is something that is quite uh, popular. Um, but we feel that for the size of buildings that we need here in India and uh, for the potential of uh, making a machine much cheaper uh, and portable uh, and lightweight, we felt that the polar printer was an ideal solution to, uh, to 3D printing of rooms and houses here in India. Uh, it would make it more affordable. Uh, we can actually uh, promote smaller projects. Um, and of course, everything is open source. So uh, we hope to uh, popularize this technology here and around the world. Uh, 
everything, designing the machine, uh, testing the machine, this is an ongoing process. Uh, but probably the most important aspect of the project is really the training. And uh, we, in fact, started a, started a training program before COVID. Then we stopped uh, because of COVID and for and other extra reasons. And uh, little by little, we've been getting some funding in. Uh, we need more to finish. But uh, in any case, the idea was uh, once the printer is running and tested, then uh, the training program would start. And uh, uh, we want to be able to share the advances that we've made and be able to create like this new breed of digital masons that we are talking about. Uh, for those that are techies, which I think there's a lot of you out there, um, this is kind of our uh, test uh, platform, you could say, of the servo motors, uh, controller, etc. Over here, for the Polar machine, we're using a more advanced uh, 3D printing controller. It's a 32-bit controller. It's a uh, it's a uh, design made in England. Uh, and uh, it's called the Duet. Uh, we're using the Duet Wi-Fi controller. Um, and uh, we're connecting these to these devices, which are servo drives. So we have servo drives connected to, you see these servos over here, and also a stepper motor. Um, so we've developed, I would say, a relatively high-end type of application. Um, we're trying to use the least amount of energy. Um, and uh, this is uh, the state of the design of the system. We're testing them. We're almost finished with this. Um, this whole box and, uh, and uh, device will be installed on the side of the printer, uh, of the new printer, the polar printer that we are finishing up. And uh, But the, we wanted to test the system before we assemble it. So this was our desktop testing, you could say. This is actually the state of the development of the technology. We have our first polar printer. Here you can see these are vertical uh, pipes. This is all made in aluminum. Um, we wanted to make it lightweight, easy to carry, easy to take from one place to the other. These are all laser cut parts uh, that are bolted together. And this is basically the carriage that I'm pointing at. And over here we have wheels that are joined so that they can roll up and down um, these pipes. Um, this whole system rotates. Uh, of course, here we're missing the horizontal boom, which is not installed yet. Um, and uh, once the boom is installed, then we will be testing the printer. Of course, we also are adding motors. Over here we have one. Uh, servo motor that uh, needs to be connected to the polar, uh, that theta um, axis. So as a polar printer, we have also three axes. And normally you call them X, Y, Z. Uh, in this case, the rotating system is called theta. And uh, the system should run with this uh, 3D printing controller. Um, of course, everything is open source. So the controller is open source. We could even make our own controllers if we needed to. Um, but uh, in this case, we were able to use the controller as is and do our small modifications so they can run at uh, and this size printer. Um, the, of course, the motors uh, can be more simple than servo motors. You can use stepper motors. We are using some stepper motors because we needed like a high torque requirements. Um, many of the motors have gearboxes, so uh, the system is a little bit more complicated than the, the Delta printer, but essentially the learning curve is similar. So uh, we, why do we build this? Is for portability, for low power consumption. In theory, the system can be running even on a solar system, on solar panels, um, and uh, the system will have a battery backup actually also uh, are here on the right you can see the group of uh, students volunteers engineering students that uh, worked on this project 
Um, so this is for summer of last year. So we finished 2022. Uh, this design, we've been continuing the development of the machine. Uh, as you saw before, the, we have the controller um, that's being assembled and tested with the servo motors. And uh, our expectation is we will be finished with the assembly of the proof of concept system on March 2023, and the testing should be starting by May. So we'll be able to really show people what this machine can do. Um, the trainings, we've done over 700, uh, or we've trained over 700 uh, students uh, in the course of uh, pretty much uh, the life of Mimbayu. We started training mostly for small wind turbine manufacturing, for village mechanics and carpenters. Um, that was a very good learning curve. We do trainings all over India, not only in Orville, uh, Karnataka, and Telangana, and uh, even in Nepal, and going to a lot of different areas and being able to show people how to build uh, a relatively complex machine, but having the ability to build it locally so that there can be local support. Uh, nowadays, we also have done uh, 3D printing workshops, uh, CNC carpentry uh, workshops for a CNC router, and then, of course, uh, 3D printing workshops for Adobe printing for the, the line. And uh, one dream that we have, which we would like to look for support from the community, is to develop an online training for how 3D printing. Uh, workshops. This would be something very nice, and I think it, it would be needed in this field. Um, and here you can see a couple of the volunteers that have tested, as you can see here, the machine and some big blocks that we printed. And this was actually done before COVID, uh, almost four years back. Here we have a video of the printer actually printing. Um, these mud blocks, it takes around 20 minutes to print one of these blocks. We can actually only print up to 70 centimeters in height. And uh, the reason for this is because the uh, mud collapses. Uh, if we uh, if we try to print anything higher, uh, we have problems uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the strength of the material as it's being printed because it's wet. Um, once it gets dry, you can print above, uh, of course, but uh, the limitation we had was uh, around 70, 80 centimeters in height. Um, so the basically the challenges that we face here in uh, our climate and conditions uh, uh, drives the research and innovation that we do. So the, this is a place where we have, uh, it's hot, it's humid, it's, uh, there's a lot of bugs, we call them buchis. And uh, essentially, it's, you'd be amazed at where, where the blood is going to. For those that are familiar with the challenges of tropical environment and electronics, you will know that the electronic equipment simply don't last as long as in other places in this type of condition. We're also by the ocean, so we have salt air, uh, so corrosion. So for example, parts of the 3D printer are uh, anodized and also um, made in stainless steel. Uh, that's for obvious reasons for uh, longevity and robustness of the machine. In, in other areas, you might be able to deal with like other type of materials like galvanized steel, etc., instead of stainless, so you can make it a little bit cheaper. In the the other issue that we face is power problems because here. Power is intermittent. Um, you don't. You never know when the power will go out, and of course, it'll go out when you're printing. So all our systems need to have battery backup or or generator backup. Um, ideally, battery backup because your controller wants to know where it left off, and um, so we we have to build in uh, backup systems into the, the machines. Uh, in addition, we we tried to reuse uh, equipment, so we we went to the secondhand uh, market uh, near us and found some servo drives, 
uh, AC servos, and so we've adapted them to run the, the pump, for example, or the FD drive. So these are, uh, I would say these are sometimes used, it's not so common, um, but what we wanted to do is use the most efficient motors we could get our hands on. And because our budget's uh, limited, we wanted to try to also save some money. So so we we like challenges and uh, we like to see what we can improve upon and we use as much as possible. It, and of course, the system can run on a renewable energy system. Um, the total energy use at this point for the system is maybe three kilowatts. Um, we will know more once the system is running, of course. Uh, the, the mixer is, uh, is running on a diesel. Uh, that's just too big to run a solar system. But uh, essentially, most of the equipment could run on solar. Um, so the, also the other thing is the inverter needs to be able to automatically start the generator. Because of course, the battery bank that we have is not going to support for hours and hours of use. So uh, the battery backup will be on. And then when the battery level is too low, then it will automatically start and generate to run, or you have to stop the system. And next, we'll have uh, Sujita talk about uh, design and materials and, uh, and discuss other areas of interest for 3D printing. Hi, I'm uh, Sujita Maitreyi. I'm an architect here at Ninvayo, and uh, we'll have a look at the application of 3D printing and automation in the field of architecture and construction industry. So uh, you see here are uh, some of the few samples of, uh, you know, Adobe structures that we have made, uh, which are in combination of natural materials such as lime, uh, rice husk, mud, and, uh, you know, hay and all that. Oh. These are some of the examples of uh, miniature models that we have uh, been trying to accomplish. And before uh, moving on to the Indian construction industry here, you can see that uh, every part of uh, manufacturing and production industry over the years have uh, tried to accommodate the innovation of uh, you know robotics or automation into their field but when you consider construction industry in india it has not been the same like uh, you take 50 years back and uh, we're still putting things together you know one brick at a time so uh, where does this go to from here in case of uh, you know the application of 3d printing technology and automation in the field of construction industry. So uh, so we try to aim to revolutionize the way we build instead of emulating the traditional methods of construction, you know, as in not building a robot to lay one brick at a time, but innovating in a way that how you put, how you design and how you make the building together in itself uh, is a whole another different process. Uh, we have the example of how biomimicry can help us, you know, apply 3D printing technology in the field of uh, building constructions. Uh, replications from nature, such as how the bone structure is formed, uh, where, you know, where it needs to take stress in and, and uh, it leaves out spaces of hollow uh, profiles in between. All of these can be incorporated into building a structure of a wall so that the building is more efficient, it doesn't waste any material, and uh, and it's also faster to put in place. So uh, here is a comparison of how a traditional construction differs from 3D printing technology. And what you see mostly here is the amount of wastage that goes into the whole process of building is reduced almost by 50%. So uh, the process that goes into is you source all the raw materials, you produce the raw materials and it has to be transported to different parts of the site and at different phases of the construction. And once it's all used, once it's all going to be demolished or dismantled, the 
the the waste that is being generated from it goes into the landfill whereas uh, even though we are material agnostic the we are trying to look at uh, sustainable materials that we can reuse even after demolition and the whole uh, wastage that is being uh, produced throughout the process of construction is almost zero when you compare it to 3d printing technology and here is a comparison of uh, different methods of construction here in india and how it can you know it can give a very rounded uh, sustainable approach when you compare concrete with fire bricks or e even sun dried adobe uh, it lacks the speed or it lacks the ease of uh, buildability whereas in earthen construction you get the freedom of form you get the ease and you also get the sustainable aspect uh, into it and uh, in addition to it uh, it will be affordable which is the most required uh, need of ihar in india because uh, we are in need of uh, cost efficient and low cost construction and 3d printing would be the way to move forward so here are a few examples of uh, one is to one uh, wall sections that have been able to build using earth mud and lime and throughout the whole uh, you know the aspect of 3d printing uh, technology in terms of construction what are the key features that can you know help uh, take this forward in terms of a social change and in terms of uh, a step into the future in terms of sustainability it uh, the project that we are approaching would be the first open source portable house printer in the world with a modular design that allows both polar and cartesian configurations and the most impact important aspect of it it would be developed via open source tools so uh, in order to make something affordable the technology that has been implemented to achieve it should also be affordable to the people that use them so this is our uh, end goal of trying to you know create a system where the building that we are trying to do is also affordable to the people who are going to build it so we'll be creating digital masons by encouraging youth women minorities and upskilling them into the construction sector which in turn reduces the cost of construction promotes low cost housing uh using material agnostic sustainable uh materials and uh, the most important uh, aspect of this construction technology is that it can rebalance the labor right now in india there are around 57 million workers and 50 million people who are employed as men and only 7 million are women so when this uh, 3d printing technology is incorporated and the more women are encouraged to take part in it it can bring down the you know population to you know the uh, the sector which goes into the construction as a balanced playing field so oh, we'll listen to architect likanya and i'm an architect who has been researching on this so i personally feel that this this kind of a technology should come to india and like should be developed further in india for local mud architecture because we need to revive the craft form in mud uh, there is a continuous uh, uh, progress to brick and concrete but without thinking of the place and the local stuff so basically we need to use the local material make it our own and make it faster and uh, for the youth and basically it even helps in the women empowerment because most of the construction uh, sites it's the women who is actually doing most of the work so you can you can teach the labor give them new skills and uh, the whole construction process can be start and thought from a newer perspective using the local mud from the site for all the techies out there who did not sign up for a class in construction and architecture so what do we need uh, now like 
there are various potential areas of development in terms of open source softwares that are in need to be used by architects like softwares that aid in parametric design and 3d printing and softwares that can help control you know the printing aspects of the polar cartesian or all sort of printers and uh, creating a knowledge sharing platform where uh, advancements in the field of 3d printing in terms of construction and architecture can help us move through the field forward and which and again will uh, you know it can be sort of like a prototype which can be applied anywhere in the world which requires low cost and affordable housing and uh, thank you that's all for now and uh, i'll uh, pass on to my colleague hello i'm back uh, so uh, how do we contribute how can others contribute to this project? Uh, uh, we have a GitHub account. Uh, we're also on Instagram and uh, we have a website. So you can always check uh, what we're up to. Um, you can volunteer. Um, there's volunteer uh, opportunities, of course, here in Oroville. Um, and uh, we, we will be coming up with ideas of how people can volunteer even remotely. Um, as uh, Sujita was mentioning just before, uh, they will we will need uh, applications, uh, software applications, or uh, ways of uh, improving the transfer of the knowledge from a uh, from a very highly technical uh, background of civil engineering and design to something that can actually be used by. Uh, a laborer, a person that's on the field uh, working on a project. Um, 3D printing, um, the machine itself is uh, is not as complicated as creating a team of workers that can operate it. And uh, in addition to that, you have a lot of quality control issues regarding feeding the machine with materials. And if we wanna transform the industry, we need to work with seamless integration. Uh, of being able to prepare materials, sensors, uh, feeding all that material into a printer in, in a consistent and high quality fashion. And this is uh, just not existent at this point. So there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in addition to making the printers work is actually uh, training programs and support of the machine in terms of material uh, feeding. And uh, and making, uh, as uh, Sujita said, the uh, parametric software that we can use that could be useful for designing just a bergomet. For for now, the most of the software that's out there that's being used is still uh, uh, Fusion 360 and other applications uh, that are parametric that are rather specialized. Um, but it would be lovely to see applications that are open source that can be modified and applied to this technology and to this need that we have. Um, we will, uh, we obviously have training programs so people can join those programs um, either for now, uh, simply here in Oroville, but later on, uh, probably also uh, online. And of course, we need sponsors. So uh, if you're interested in uh, volunteering or contributing in some way or another um, and becoming a sponsor also, we are very happy um, to receive your help. Uh, as always, this is a community effort and everybody is welcome to contribute. And finally, I would like to give a big thanks to our volunteers, Sujita, Venka, Tadavandu, Peter, John, Joshua, Yan, Situ, Meganathan, Sai, Praven, and of course, many others that have been coming, going, uh, visiting us and helping us in all kinds of different projects. Uh, thank you all for all your help and collaboration. Um, you can contact us, uh, email, uh, uh, look at our website, uh, and uh, we look forward to collaborating with the uh, global open source community. Thank you very much for your time.